Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for our Tubica AMF webinar, Business Best Practices. Um, we are here with a bunch of industry greats. I love these people. They're from all over the country. We've got such a wide swath. And today we're gonna um, talk about, you know, as we navigate through today's challenging times, we try to join together as a group for you to offer advice, guidance, and of course, glimmers of hope, right? Well, this webinar brings together, like I said, our seasoned proprietors across many states and different areas of the entertainment industry. And we're gonna discuss how they've managed their business during this COVID-19 time and what they're doing to prepare to reopen in the upcoming days, weeks, and possibly months. I will let you know that if you have your video on, you may wanna turn that video off. We will not be using video for today's meeting. So if you are a participant, you can feel free to turn your video off as long as you can hear us. Everybody will be kept on mute, please. If you would keep yourself on mute, that would be helpful so we can hear our panelists when they speak. My name is Jay Nephew, and I'm gonna be your host for today's webinar. And with me, I have Kyle Calcote, who is our webinar manager. Kyle keeps the behind the scenes running. He's letting you in from the meeting room, and he will also be monitoring the chat room. The chat area, uh, the chat button at the lower part of your console, you can click on that and open up the chat room and you can type in any questions you may have there. So if you have questions for our panelists or just in general for anyone, certainly let us know through there. Kyle will monitor that. I'll do my best to keep my eye on it too. And we'll bring those up as, as they uh, come into, into topics, shall we say. I do wanna get right into discussing and introducing our panelists for today's webinar. Um, we'll start off with uh, going alphabetical order, no preference shown here. First of all, let me, uh, I gotta advance my screen. I apologize, I, I did not uh, click on my right monitor here. You got too many monitors going on, it's not always good. Here's our wonderful panelist today. Um, first up, we have, I gotta put all the names and stuff up. Oop, went a little too far, sorry guys. And sorry guys again, there we go. First up, we have Kyle Allison. Uh, growing up in a family of entrepreneurs, Kyle learned at a young age uh, the risk and rewards of small business. Kyle worked in his family business all through high school, where he learned a strong work ethic, how to manage product, projects, and think on his feet. After college, Kyle returned to Norman, Oklahoma to help his family run their business. The Allison family owns Allison's Fund Incorporated. It's a corporate event company that produces events across the South Central U.S. They also own Andy's Alligator Fun Park and Water Park, which is a family entertainment center with activities for the entire family, including a boutique water park. Now in late 2019, Kyle opened up a brand new venture in Midwest City, Oklahoma, Altitude 1291. It's home to a 27,000 square foot indoor fun, including bowling, laser tag, arcades, virtual reality, and full service restaurants. Kyle stays involved in the community and he served on the Norman City Council, the Visit Norman Board of Directors and the Board of Norman Chamber of Commerce. Kyle and his wife, Amanda, have two daughters, Claire and Madeline. Well, let's say hi to Claire and Madeline and welcome Mr. Kyle Allison. Thank you for joining us, Kyle. Is Kyle with us still? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry, Kyle. I just wanted you to say hi. All right. Hi. Next up, Mr. Craig Buster. Craig Buster is the general manager of Wild Islands Coconut Bowl in Sparks, Nevada, and he's been there since 2001. He has been in the family entertainment center industry with Wild Islands since 1993, and he's played an integral part of the growth and expansion of Coconut Bowl at Wild Island throughout those years. He and his team run a facility that includes seven indoor attractions, two outdoor 18-hole miniature golf courses, and a 100-plus game arcade. The 125,000-square-foot indoor facility also has five private event rooms, two service bars, grills, food trucks, and a full-service catering program. He's certified ServeSafe food manager, which is important in these days and age, and is currently serving on the BPAA Education and FEC Committee. He's also the vice president for the Northern Carolina slash Nevada BPAA and an IAPA member since 1993. And he's the chairman for the education program. Let's welcome Mr. Craig Buster. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today, Craig. 
Our next guest speaker is Karen Davis Farage. Karen is president and co-owner of RPM Raceway. She's got over 40 years of experience building new and innovative businesses. They have six locations throughout New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, and their Stanford, Connecticut location is their first full-blown FEC, complete with Cubica AMS string bowling, high-speed indoor go-karts, and over 60 arcade games, virtual reality simulators, and full-service restaurant and bar. It's truly an amazing center. They also have eight lanes of highway mini bowling and BestX dual mode, so they're in their Farmington, New York location. Uh, Karen has also served on many boards throughout the tri-state area and has been awarded multiple honors, including the NJ Biz 50 Best Women in Business Award and being named to the top 25 leading women entrepreneurs, an award honoring women business owners who excel in innovation and advocacy for women. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank Our you. final, you're very welcome. Our final guest is Mr. Monty Pyburn. Monty comes to us with more than 20 years of experience in high-end and casual restaurants. Monty joins us as Director of Operations for Whirly Ball with five locations in the Chicagoland area. Monty also adds nine years of previous experience as the Director of Operations for IPIC Entertainment, one of the very first companies to popularize dine-in luxury movie theaters. Thank you for joining us, Monty. Okay, let's dig right into today's topic. You know, we have all been through the last month or so of most of us being entirely closed. Hopefully some people have been able to do food service with to-go orders uh, and curbside pickup. Um, but what have you done? Uh, let's take a, 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 a I want to ask each one and every one of you, I want to take a step and consider what is going to, what is it going to look like when we go back to business and we have the quote new normal, or I like to call it a new revised reality because a lot of people don't like that term new normal. Who wants to chime in on that? Well, this I'm going to pick. I Kyle, can, go ahead. I was going to pick on you. Go ahead, Kyle. I, well, you know, we were actually having a discussion today because we started our employee trainings just um, about an hour ago as we, we reopened on Friday, our Midwest City Bowling location. And it's very interesting. Everyone kind of has their ideas of what it's going to be, but I don't think we do know until we get open. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of something for us all to wonder. Hey, that's a good point is, uh, you know, with Whirly Ball, we... Um, we're, we're trying to discuss on a, on a weekly basis of how this is going to look. And, you know, we're following the, the groups that uh, are opening for IE Atlanta, um, you know, and I can't wait to hear more information on that to see how, how it's actually going to happen because in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Colorado, they're all different. And it seems like they keep changing the rules on a, on a weekly basis. Yeah, I've heard that, Monty. I've heard that. Um, Karen, do you have anything to add? Well, I would just say we're probably in a little bit different situation than everyone else based on our geography. So um, we're yeah. in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And, and you're in that high, high impact area. Exactly. So we're not only in high impact areas, but we're probably in areas where we will be, you know, phase one for us will be still some time out. Um, yeah. I think the most important thing is creating a plan that you understand is going to be flexible um, from the time you're planning it, which is now, until you open, and really communicating how important it is to your team members that, that they understand that their flexibility uh, is going to be front and center, that things yeah. are going to continue to evolve and change, and they're part of making that change happen. Beautiful. Well, that's well said. Um, I want to ask each and every one of you, what have you been doing during the downtime? Have any of you been able to get into your center and tackle some projects maybe that you haven't, haven't had the time to do? I know some of you have relatively new facilities, so there's not a lot to be done, but um, have you been able to uh, maximize that time to your advantage? Yeah, I, think I can speak this. for... Oh, go, go ahead, I'm Karen. Sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. That's, that's the disadvantage of not having the video. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I can, I, can, uh, I can speak for us in that um, we actually did something on the front end. Um, we kept all of our managers and some of our team members on for the first week 
in order to enable that process so that they would all feel kind of from a mental state that when it was time to walk back in and think about it now, like so, so much has gone on since then, but the thinking was when they walk back in, um, their facilities are gonna be in, in the order, if you will, that they would want them to be, mm. um, which kind of gives them a head start on then the, the efforts that have, we have to go forth with in order to comply and, do, and follow our strategic plan to open. Uh, Kyle? Yeah, you know, we were able to keep on our um, salary managers as well through the time um, with the assistance of the PPP program. Um, we were able to keep those employees going. So we did have um, employees working every once in a while, cleaning, um, doing a deep clean of the kitchen, deep clean of the facility, a couple projects done. It was tough for us. We just opened up in late November. So we're a right. relatively uh, brand new facility. Um, so we there was not a ton to be done, which was tough. But um, like, I mean, for one of the things I'll tell you, we, to save money, we are not using a ground cert, grounds keeping service anymore. No one to mow the lawn. So last week, me and all the managers, we got out and mowed the lawn together out in front of the park. So, um, you know, we're making everyone get work done as we can. Talk about team building. That's a great one. I hope my boss isn't listening. <laughs> Monty or Craig, do you have anything else to add? You know, we've we've kind of done a lot of the similar things. Uh, as a business, we decided to, after all this happened, to pause, reset, and now it's time to pivot. Um, uh, we've done all the preventative maintenance on every on all of our equipment, including all of our attractions, bowling machines. Uh, we've also kept on every salaried position, which is our management. And then uh, we've kept on, on a voluntary basis, any hourly leadership or supervisors that wanted to stay on. Uh, that's kind of weeded itself out, so to speak. Uh, and we're continuing to do that today and just kind of cleaning up the place. You know, our facility has been expanded three times. So the oldest part is actually in 2003 when it opened. Wow. Um, we did um, completely sanitize the entire facility. Uh, and then while we're still here using it, doing some maintenance, we've just closed down all the bathrooms except for two some certain areas for the kids to eat. Um, and then one of the things we're working on right now to kind of move forward is uh, an online survey for guests. I think every part of the country is gonna have different uh, struggles and challenges. And uh, like Kyle said, we don't know what all of them are. And uh, the online survey is basically gonna kind of hopefully give us some direction on uh, what direction we'll take with the business. Nice. Now, Monty, you have a unique situation because you have at least one location that I know of that I don't believe is opened yet, correct? Oh, no, no. We got it open. You did uh, get it opened. Okay. Yeah, we opened two and <laughs> uh, it was uh, November, December of last year. They were right on top of each other. Similar uh, to Kyle. Well, yeah, with that being said, you know, we've taken the time to actually go back and complete a lot of the projects, you know, whether it's, you know, the training materials or uh, systems that just didn't happen because we opened two on top of each other. So getting organized as an organization is something that we've been working on. We kept our facilities teams on to go back with our older sites, get them cleaned up, painted, uh, other projects that needed to happen uh, that always got overlooked because they were too big or, or whatever. Right. Uh, we've also, uh, you know, realized that, you know, when, when this all comes back, we're not going to be able to run uh, at the same levels that we were. So we've, we've got a, uh, a reopening plan that's, that's really kind of like, uh, I think it was Craig was speaking that, you know, they're all mowing the lawn together. You know, managers are going to have a different role uh, as, uh, as these things open back up. Okay, great. Um, I want to move on to another topic. I, I like that idea, Monty. I really, and, and Kyle, it does bring your staff together differently when you go through something like this together. And then, you know, they feel, I believe they feel more of an ownership role with you in the company because they're having to just come together and do whatever it takes to get by. And in this case, mowing the lawn, it, it, it it's fine. I mean, it, 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 be, it gives them a different sense of togetherness and, I, and that's a great way to uh, make use of a not great situation. So kudos to you for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about pre-branding your facility when you're getting ready to reopen. Now, pre-branding is what you do when you're rebranding your company in a changed environment like we're in today and showing how your brand maybe fits with the new world and meets the new customer or the customer's new needs. 
So what, and here's some examples that we've you know, seen in pre-branding, removing photos of large groups or large crowds on your website, um, photos, including photos of employees and some kind of PPE, maybe masks, Etc. Um, have you having promoted what you have done to adhere to things like OSHA and the CDC standards on your website and keeping your customers safe and implementing new operational processes to meet the requirements of social distancing. So I'm going to start asking you right now. I'll go down the line. What have you guys done with your particular businesses to help with this pre banding or have you attacked this yet, Kyle? Sure. So with uh, finding out that we're going to be opening up this Friday, one of our facilities, we didn't really find out until the end of last week. Um, luckily, I will. We were we did order materials and some of our PPE and different the floor stickers and stuff like that ahead of time, anticipating this happening. So any of you who have not ordered that stuff yet, I would say go ahead and order it because it does take a while to get. Um, sure. So that that's one tip I'll give everyone. Now, we, as far as the branding component, when this first started, we did uh, when the you know, virus, the pause started, we had to cut back on a lot of marketing expenses. So um, since we had been opening, we had been hiring an outside agency to do a lot of our social media. We brought that in house. Um, and we, we took the step of, we, we are a family owned business. We've built a facility that looks very corporate. It looks, um, you know, kind of franchise-ish because we want to have all the systems in place, but we didn't feel like we were conveying that we are a family owned business. So I started doing a lot of Facebook live videos myself um, having, you know, my family in them. We did one right away when everything first started where I had my kids in the video talking about how we feel this is a safe environment. Um, so really connecting with our audience and showing that we are a family locally owned facility. And I think that has helped um, kind of rebrand us in a way that everyone thought we were a big, you know, franchise coming in town. So that's been one thing that we've focused on. And then as far as just within the last couple of days, we've started posting our opening guidelines on our website. We did kind of a teaser this morning that we're going to be opening Friday, but we're also being very uh, careful about how much we post and that we don't uh, create, we don't welcome unneeded um, comments about how we're one of the first people to open um, in the market. Right. That's, you bring a good point up there. Um, you know, yesterday I was uh, doing Beyond the Frame. Uh, and I had the pleasure of hosting uh, b and uh, Nancy Shank. She's the past president of BPAA, b and Bowling Lanes. And she shared with me how her remodel project that they did, and they're rebranding their facility, their little 24-lane center. They're bringing that family-owned component in, and they're telling that story with new uh, pictures on the wall. And it's the way that they're marketing. So I personally think that if you have the ability to make that kind of a statement with your business, even if you have multiple locations, like you know, many of you do, um, it, it can still feel family run and community based. So if you can take advantage of that, I, I encourage people to do that. Let's, I'm gonna go to Karen now, I'm gonna ask Karen, what have you been doing with your um, businesses for the pre-branding type of thing? Sure. Um... Well, the first thing I have to say is I've spent a very significant amount of time getting educated. Um, I, I'm overwhelmed and yet in awe of the amount of information available to all of us. So it's crazy. A lot of info. You are so right there. <laughs> so, um, you know, following the industry is just one of them, you know, following mm -hmm. IAP and AMAA and, and, and the bowling association and the trade magazines and F2FEC and the restaurant association, all of them. Um, and as we get closer and closer, I think, and there are examples out there about reopening, which just, you know, the last four or five days of our lives, it's changing and, mm -hmm. the, and the pivot is occurring, which is, is uplifting. So reading everything and then, you know, being extremely attentive to it, both at the, at the federal, state and local level. Um, so we've been, um, and also sourcing new vendors to the point that's already been made. We wow. are gonna have vendors that we've never had a relationship with. And I mean, in all sincerity, we were going to Costco for our cleaning supplies before and that will no longer do so sourcing new vem vendors is part of that um, and number two from a branding and marketing standpoint 
Um, we've spent the time to do um, updated outreach, if you will, to the chambers. And we belong to every chamber in every region um, because that's to us a great way to get to the one to many, if you will, from a corporate and biz and part uh, event standpoint. Again, Whoops, so sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, um, so getting exposure on their sites, making sure that um, all of our um, branding is updated on all those CVBs and chamber and industry sites where we might get more play so that as we get ready to open and once we open, we have more access points that cost us less in order to expose ourselves to and educate on what we've done in order to create a safe and memorable experience to everyone. Um, sure. We've worked on um, our event outreach. So obviously like everyone, not only did we close with everybody canceling everything, but then we had to cancel all of the events, both personal, corporate, um, uh, and association events that we had on our books. So now we're re-engaging all of them um, to try to get them re not just rescheduled, but ensure that they feel comfortable and confident about the environment that they're gonna come back into. Um, yeah, you said a good, you said a good point there, making sure the customer feels comfortable, comfortable and confident. I think those are two things that, you know, that should be the uh, our overarching message when you talk about what you've done. Make sure that what you're going to tell them either ticks one of those boxes for either one or both of them. So, yeah. Exactly. And that's, um, that's part of what, you know, we see in the guest outreach and communication, which is number three what are we going to be doing to ensure that you do have a safe and memorable experience? What are we going to look like when you walk in our door that's going to look different than it might have looked before, but it's there to protect you? What are mm -hmm. we going to expect you? So for everybody that doesn't walk in with a mask, we're going to have to make sure that we provide that mask to them because that's going to be critical. Uh, yeah, if that's what you want for your facility. Yeah, I, I agree. We have local grocery stores here and I'm in the Houston area. And we have local grocery stores that um, will provide a mask if you don't have one, but you can't go in the store without one. So exactly. yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the, the, um, we, we happen to have a new website that was just finished several months ago and we did a very quiet um, launch of it. it. It provided better ways to communicate. It provided um, unbelievable uh, pictures and whatnot. But one of the things we've been doing is adding to the blog and now um, they're going to be, the marketing team will be interviewing myself, I think, as one of those people so that we can talk, not, you know, in an audience. Uh, we may have lost Karen for a moment. I'm going to move to Monty. Monty. Oh, sorry, Karen. You cut out for a moment, Karen. So those are some of the, some of the many things that we're doing. Okay. Thank you for that. I apologize. You did cut off at the end. I'm going to move to Monty now. Monty, can you give us a little update with Whirly Ball, where you guys are with uh, some of the things you've been doing to, to uh, address these points? Uh, yeah, we've been arguing a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? It's no, never it's, a one-way thing, isn't it? There's always going to be varying opinions. A of, there's a lot of strong personalities on, uh, in, in our group, which is fine because uh, that makes us stronger. Uh, but um, when it comes to the, the branding component, um, we, um, you know, we're, we're in, in our new site specifically, you know, we're a little bit higher end. Uh, we don't necessarily want to remind the guests when they're coming in that, you know, uh, about the COVID or coronavirus or whatever they're calling it this week. Um, so we, we feel that we're an escapism and we want our, our PPE to be blending in. So we're looking at branded uh, uh, face masks. Uh, for the staff to where it looks like it's part of the uniform. We're going to, um, after each area has been sanitized, it's going to have uh, <coughs> a tag sanitized with the, uh, the employee's name on it. Uh, with our sanitizing stations, um, they will, they will uh, fit in as, as much as we possibly can, uh, but we will be showing our guests, you know, hey, you can sanitize, things like that. As far as the Whirly Ball itself, those get 
those pretty much have always been sanitized uh, because people get a little aggressive out there. Same thing with the laser tag, you know, we always have sanitized those. So we just have to um, do it a little bit more so the guest sees it. Mm. Uh, but uh, Make it more uh, prominent. Yeah, I'm just sure everybody, every time you open your email, it's something else about the, the COVID-19. Yeah. And we, we want to kind of, you know, it's, you know, let you know we're taking care of it, but, you know, create the escapism that, uh, you know, people are going to be looking for after all this. Um, you know, with the, the corporate events, you know, it's 80% of our business. Um, they have been real resp- uh, receptive to rebooking and waiting for us to come back. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're communicating with, uh, uh, you know, them on a monthly basis with all the events that we had to move, things like that. Uh, we got quiet on social media uh, as um, I totally agree with just because there's, you know, again, everybody is, is trying to feel relevant right now in this, in this world. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to keep quiet on that end. And then when we get a date, we can really talk to our, our people. Uh, and then, you know, obviously just the social distancing, it'll be well-branded uh, on the floors and things like that. So it doesn't really, you can see it, but, but you kind of have to go, oh, okay, there it is. Right. You know, you bring up a really interesting point. Um, and I've talked to owner operators, proprietors, managers with both points of view. And you have one end of it where you, you don't want your customers to walk in the door and feel like they're walking into uh, a hospital setting, you know, where everybody's covered from head to toe with all this protective gear, because the reason they're coming to you is to get away from that. I agree with that. I also see the point of view of those that say, look, I want to do everything kind of protect my people. And I think there is that balance that's right for your business and maybe something that is is better suited for another person's business. There is no right or wrong way to do this. So it's just a matter of opinion. So which is hence, hence probably why you've had some arguments along the way, but your uh, idea of doing branded face masks, I think is actually, it's the first I've heard, somebody think this way about it. I think it's the, it's genius and I, I look forward to seeing them. You know, and if one comes to me in the end, you know, I'll wear it, of course. <laughs> I'm going to move to Craig Buster now. Craig, what do you want to talk about uh, when it comes to this topic here? I think there's a lot of, a lot of things to discuss there, but, uh, you know, as frustrating as it is for business owners and operators, um, we, we just, after we got past that moment, we decided it was a, a chance for us to reopen. So when you talk about branding, it's uh, kind of like Kyle said, it's, you can, uh, you can really push local. I mean, we're a locally owned business as well. You know, people, it's kind of like, uh, I hate to reference 9-11, but uh, after 9-11, people really went local a lot as well. Mm. I, think, I think you need to kind of, you know, push it and make sure it's as positive as possible. Um, we live and die, but what we call our brand pillars. So we, uh, we focus on that a lot. Um, in addition to that, I think what Monty says is uh, great. We don't want our business to look like a, a, a hospital, uh, and it's a, it's a great place for people to escape reality. Uh, we always keep our signage at a third grade level because that's pretty much where everybody's brains are when they walk into our <laughs> facilities, which is great. That's what you want. I mean, you want yeah, to escape you do. From reality. Yeah. Um, but we are going to have what we call a COVID one sheet. It's going to be on our website and kind of talks about all the safety measures that we will be taking at our water park and our family entertainment center. Um, there'll be some signage as you walk into the facility, uh, kind of just talking about what different things when people buy online, uh, how, how we're going to be doing things uh, and trying to keep people as safe as possible. Uh, we are also ordered uh, branded uh, masks. Uh, I came up with the idea today to have put smiles on them because you can't really see Ooh, anybody smiling. So it's kind of That's weird. a great idea. So we might do that. And then uh, just kind of bouncing around a little bit. Our floor cleans are going to have some QR codes. So if folks don't want to wait in line or aren't comfortable in the QR code, what they can do is they can, it'll take them to buy online. So whether it's our food or online reservations for lanes or our attractions, um, it just kind of, it'll just be informative, not just, uh, you know, as, as Monty said, just kind of wanted to blend in as best we can. Um, some of our signage as you walk into the facility will also say what we are and aren't doing. Um, and one of the pieces that we're probably going to be focused on is this will be a challenging one is that we're not going to play the social distancing police, uh, which I think is going to be, I mean, we will within reason, but it's going to be very hard uh, to yeah. deal with. I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges everybody's going to have to deal with. But we're going to try to 
convey that to our guests as uh, best we can with less touch points. You know, our, our staff, porters, whatever you want to call them, our facilities, they're going to have shirts that say clean team or sanitization team. And they'll be the ones that are kind of in charge of doing a lot of that. Uh, to touch on what Karen said, uh, I, I would agree with her wholeheartedly. Education is so important and uh, helping each other out in the industry um, is, is paramount to me. And I've learned so much from everybody and I, I, that's why I love to share so much. Um, vendors, uh, she mentioned that. We have definitely uh, sourced new vendors and gotten rid of some vendors. Um, I look at it as it's a relationship, just like anything else. And if none of those people contacted me, we may not do business with them in the future. They obviously didn't value our business. I mean, even a simple email. Um, so those are some things that we've done. And we also took advantage of like chicken wing prices here out in, uh, on the West Coast went down 50% locally. So we bought as much as we could and filled our freezers. Yeah, <laughs> so we're that's prepared. a great. Yeah, we just yeah. make a little bit more money off of it. Um, yeah. So um, you, you uh, also brought up some really interesting things. Taking something like a floor clang that's meant to space people out, you're right in the sense that you probably shouldn't be the ones being the police for the social distancing because, as we all know, what if a family of four comes in? They four people, those four people can be together. And we don't know who's with who, especially in a water park when you've got bathing suits on and you're running from attraction to attraction or whatever. So uh, I agree with you that it, it's probably not in the best interest to be that police person, but to, you know, to suggest it and to show and say, look, we're taking these measures to keep you safe, but you also have a, a, a ownership in this game. Um, I love the idea of taking the floor cling and putting a QR code on it because you're taking something that you, that you have to do really to, to function in today's uh, COVID world, and you're using it as a tool to help the customer. That's brilliant. So good job on that. I want to, I'm going to just say this one statement, you know, I've been reading, Karen, this goes back to what you said, trying to keep up with industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we re, we get uh, just scads of emails and, you know, white papers and thought leadership stuff every day. And the one that I got from uh, AMA, the marketing association had, you know, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing with your marketing. But the one line that stood out to me uh, when it when it's talking about adjusting marketing campaigns and timelines, this one statement, it says, and now it's time to pivot, craft a message that is sensitive to the current situation, takes into account your customers, new situations and concerns, and is honest, transparent and human. And at the end of the day, that's all we should be doing, right? So I like that little statement. It reminds me to just keep it simple, tell them what they need to know and show them that, you know, you're human with them and, and you're, you're in this to help them have a good time in your facility, but also to stay safe. Okay, I'm gonna to transition to another hey, topic hey, now. Jay, before we move sure. on to the next topic, we did have um, a question in the chat about the okay. branded face masks for either Monty or Craig. And they were just wondering if you have a vendor uh, that you would be willing to share and recommend. Great question. Oops, sorry. Uh, I can, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can, uh, I can get that out. Um, I started with Google, not gonna lie. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of branding companies out there. We're looking at several that are local just to try to keep the business in the locality for our for our partner con, uh, retail organizations, but they're all over the place. Everyone's doing them. And like you said, the key with the local piece is also the timeline to get the items. Uh, make sure you look at all the timelines of when people are able to get them for you because um, them getting them to you in a month may be okay, but for me it didn't work because we were so quick to get back open um, in a short time frame. So we really had to watch the lead times on all of those items. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen the BPAA put out a, um, a new website a couple of days ago, I believe, and there are some links on there for some people doing the custom face masks, I believe. Yeah, we utilized somebody local and uh, Classic actually was the ones that helped us get some as well. Beautiful. Okay, so let me uh, move on to the next little area. Um, this kind of goes together because I have two things. I, I, I wanted to ask each of you about how you're reimagining entertainment based on your business models, but that will really flow into um, what changes are you planning to make when it comes to things like cleaning 
uh, cleaning procedures in your facility. So let's kind of put that together and I'll start with Craig this time. Craig, what kind of changes are you planning to make when it comes to geek cleaning and sanitizing, but also reimagining how the entertainment works in your facility? Well, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty, <laughs> that's a I know, I know. Um, hopefully I answer your, 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 your question as best I can here. But, uh, you know, as for on the bowling end of things, since all of us have, uh, or most of us, I would assume have bowling, is that, uh, you know, it's, we're going to have one ball on, the, on a pair, pretty much we're going to have a, uh, you know, basically one family, quote unquote, or one group on a pair of lanes. We're going to do the odds on odd days and evens on the even. Uh, of course, this could all change in a hot minute. Um, right. And we will have basically every ball, you know, eight, nine, ten on the rack already, and that's all you you will get to use. We will sanitize those after and the whole settee area after they are done and moving on to the next group. Uh, same with leagues. Uh, leagues, we're going to like a night league. We're going to do in two shifts. Uh, we'll do something at just say six ish and eight ish. Uh, so if it's a, you have 20 lanes, it's a, you put 10 lanes out and 10 lanes, uh, 10 lanes at six and 10 lanes at eight. Um, you know, just kind of give some options there. Uh, for open play, we're going to give them the option of purchasing uh, logoed shoe covers or they can rent shoes. I think there could be a percentage of people that are weirded out by renting shoes. There was before, so there, there might be now. Um, less touch points is really important for us. Uh, we're getting, really pushing Apple and Samsung Pay, so there's less touch points at the, at the POSs. Um, and Contactless all, payment is huge. That's a great concept right there. A good thing to, to you know to go on to. Yeah, I mean it just it's easier. I use it and I, I love it. I mean uh, it, it's great. I think there's a lot of things. You know, all of our attractions are going to be cleaned uh, different ways. You know, from the go karts to laser tag to the games, our, our arcade. Basically, every other game will just be off or red, so to speak, to create some social distancing. We'll have an attendant walk around with a UV wand, uh, cleaning all the games the entire time. And then our laser tag and go karts. It's pretty easy because we can just cut the, cut it in half and have them cleaning half while the other half is doing the attraction. Okay. Uh, Hopefully that hopefully that kind of answers your question there. Sure, uh, Karen. What about you? Um, you know, I, I think we're all going to look very very similar once we all figure out right what the right uh, what the right formula, if you will, is. But um, for us, it's obviously going to start with new education and team training. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to put, we've got to define those operational guidelines. Um, and then we've got to um, cross train and provide, you know, what the attraction specifics are and what the cleaning procedures are. Uh, if, if we make sure that everybody has a mask on and we encourage uh, gloves, um, that, you know, that takes us very far. Yeah. Um, because, we actually capture every single person who comes into RPM Raceway at any of our sites. They immediately register online or on a, uh, I should say on an iPad, but they can now do that online. So we're going to encourage some changes in procedure, um, even, even getting into the queue for racing. It's interesting since we're the, you know, I guess we're the one that is um, racing is our core um as a business uh, the least racing has affected the least the only right. area where we really have an issue is when we are doing our um training video to anyone who's never raced before and keeping them at six feet apart will be a little bit challenging but other than that um you have a mask on and then you put your helmet on Obviously, those helmets, we're looking at several different technologies right now, which will sanitize helmets in a way that have, has never been the case before. But wow. we're, pretty, we're pretty optimistic in that even before we close, uh, we're closed by the state, our business was at about 50%. So people have a confidence in RPM Raceway being in a, a professional venue that um, that honors each guest that walks in the door by doing the right thing. And we're, we're hoping, hoping, hoping that, as you mentioned before, that confidence, as long as we back it up with everything that we're doing. So the, 
the carts will be cleaned every single time um, someone races in them. Um, the, our um, simulator rides are not going to be an issue. Our, um, our um, VR, we have Holligate, that's not going to be an issue, cleaning that every time we're going to be able to make people feel confident. Um, I think the biggest challenge is really games. And, you know, if they congregate around a game, it has to be family members that are congregating together. And then I hate to use the word policing that, but we're going to have roamers. And those roamers are going to ask very kind questions of people because it comes back to that confidence. Every, you know, we're in a business that has a level of risk um, being the racing. And so it's, it's in our DNA to do everything in our power to make people feel safe when they come in to race. And if we take that same mentality, if you will, that same messaging, and we apply it across the whole organization and everything that we have in every store, um, I think we'll be successful. But it, it starts with training and it starts with defining those new operational changes up front, putting them in writing, um, using our LMS, and making sure that our team members um, are doing their jobs. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, especially, uh, you know, you say just continuing to do what you do to make them feel safe and to build that confidence with them. Uh, that's that's obviously uh, once you've gotten to that level with your messaging and your operational status and the way people feel about you, it's easier to maintain. For those that haven't maybe gotten there yet, they're going to have to invest some energy and time to to make to make their customers feel that way too. But I think um, most of the operators have been. Uh, especially at your level, they've been doing that all along. So uh, I, I'm really interested in that new technology about cleaning the helmets because this is a, uh, it's interesting some of the stuff that's come up with this disease, with this, uh, with this virus, it's really forced us to look into technology in a different way and use, using it to solve some of our, our concerns and issues. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in right now uh, and a lot of them are revolving around league bowling. So Craig, I'm gonna start with you and I'll, I'll let you answer the question if you have anything to add to that. But uh, because you, you do have league at your facility, correct? Yeah, we're one of the few FECs that does, yeah. Yeah, um, how are you, uh, let me just find the question really quickly on here. It says, how do you plan to realize social distancing on league play? That's going to be difficult. Marco uh, Pietz, I don't know how to say his last name, Pietzinger, Pietzinger. Sorry, Marco, just Marco, <laughs> poor Marco P. Marco P wants to know. And we've had other questions come in. So what do you vision, envision that to look like for your facility? Well, we, uh, we started, we just recently created a Facebook page for, our, for just for our league bowlers to kind of uh, communicate with them through. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is just try to, in, you know, have a little bit of personal responsibility. I think like Karen said, I think your, your history, uh, you know, proceeds itself in a way because if you've created a safe environment, people a clean environment, people are going to know what kind of facility you run. But like I said before, what we're going to do is just have two shifts, uh, 20, let's just say 20 teams, 10 come at six and 10 come at eight. And they will be like on lanes one, three, five, seven, that type of thing, uh, just to kind of create that social distancing. And I know that may not work uh, in every way, shape, or form, but right now, that's kind of the best idea we have, and we're just going to recommend to people that, you know, whatever the, the PPE requirements are by our state or local governments or health department, we will follow, and we will ask them to follow them as well, and then I think that they'll, you know, bowlers have been pounded on doors, man. They want to bowl. They, it's just who they are inherently, so I think that they will cooperate for the most part, and I don't think we'll have too many issues. I agree. And yeah, you, there's no lack of people w just biting, chomping at the bit to get in there to bowl. If you look at Facebook, it's all about that. Um, Kyle, you also have a high level of league play at your facility. What are you looking at uh, in, in your facility to do? Do you have a plan yet? Or are you kind of waiting to see? Because Craig, you did say, and it's true, everybody's going to have different um, mandates based on their maybe state, maybe their local county, whatever. So it is, it, there's not a one size fits all. Your layout makes a difference too. If you're two-sided house and you've got, you know, a split house. I mean, there's so many factors that I don't think we can put a, this is exactly how you do league play. I think it has to be case by case. Kyle, what are you, what are you seeing with that? Yeah, we actually, we don't have league play in our oh you don't have league play i'm sorry 
no, you're fine. I, the one challenge we have with bowling is bowling is just one of our attractions. I mean, you could say it's probably our anchor attraction, but we only have 12 lanes. So by us cutting our capacity, we're down right to six lanes. So that's mm-hmm. one thing that we're, we are concerned about um, with capacity issues. Sure, sure. And speaking of capacity, <laughs> we're, that's, that's, that's the other question that people are asking. What effect on your capacity do you expect when you reopen? Um, if you have a small facility, I mean, honestly, you can use what every other lane, every third lane, every pair. Uh, if a group of 10 people come in that are in the same family, do you still force them to go to two different lanes? How does that really work? Monty, what, what, are, you look, what are you thinking about that kind of concept right there? Well, if you have 10 people coming in, um, you know, we're, we're going to be, uh, it's so tough. We're I putting know. Barriers, barriers in between our sofas. Our sofas go back to back. So we're, okay. different. so we're putting barriers in between our sofas, but that does still allow the approach to be open. Yeah, I don't see any way to cut the approach in half and put a plastic panel on the approach. It affects the play, right? So yeah, it, it, I don't see that happening. So I think, um, again, we could try to police it, uh, but I think the, the public is going to police themselves in this. All we can do is remind them. I agree. Them. I uh, agree. So maybe we, we have, uh, uh, you know, some table tents, that just, you know, friendly reminder of social distancing, uh, things like that. But, um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate because we don't get a lot of walk-in business. I mean, about 20% of our business is walk-in. Most everything else is reservation. So we can, you know, kind of think ahead and, and try to hopefully figure it out. You know, maybe address it when they come in. Hey, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, let's let's make sure, you know, we keep mind on the, the distancing and things like that. But um, I think we're fortunate that phase three comes along and then the distancing actually goes away as a business. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody knows anything different or if it's changed. Uh, but I think the, the the public will will start kind of doing that on their own. That's the way I feel about it. I think you're you're on you're spot on there. I, I really do. Um, one other question here that was interesting. <laughs> I like this question because I've seen that. I'm going to talk about what I've seen. It says, "Do you have any suggestions for customers not having to touch the restroom door to enter?" And someone answered in the chat. That was from Teresa Orr. And William, uh, why do people with these long last names, I picked the wrong ones. William M, sorry, William, Monzadelis. Monzadelis, I said it right, I'm sure I did. William, you said remove the door. We just did that in our centers. That is true, you could just remove the door. But what I've seen at uh, some food service places is they have a, it's almost like the old style metal bottle opener that you would screw onto the bar and you'd hook the bottle and flip it up like that. It's like a foot thing. It goes down at the bottom of the door and it allows you to open the door inward with your foot. Hey, Jay, so, yeah. I, we actually just put those in. Uh, they're, <laughs> called, they're called step and pull. You can just find them on Amazon. We put them on every bathroom. So our bathroom's open in. So to leave the bathroom, you just put your foot on it and open the door. They work amazing and they're 20 bucks each. You can awesome. Also- you can also, um, I worked with uh, a high-end restaurant at one point in my career, and we had little placards on the, um, on the uh, right by our paper towels that said, you know, it's flu season, uh, please feel free to, to take a paper towel and use it to open the door as you leave. Mm-hmm. Leaving nice a little, little waste can trash. by the door. Yep, trash can right there by it, yep. I like that, what's called, say that again, Craig, what are they called? Step and the end of the letter N, pull. Just step, step and pull. Step and pull. Okay, great. So all you people out there listening, step and pull, Amazon. They're going to be sold out tomorrow, so hurry up and get your orders in. <laughs> um, let's switch to food and beverage, because all of you sell food and beverage. And we had a question uh, come in for food and beverage. And it says, I'm trying to find it again, because they're coming in and I'm rolling up. It said, what is the thought on how you'll be serving food and beverage? Karen, I'm going to start with you on this one. So, okay. Um, Well, we have in multiple of our uh, venues, we have a snack bar. So um, I have to be, you know, I would only be transparent. We have not thought through, thought this through yet because we believe that each of these regions is going to be very specific about the food. Okay. And therefore, we are, you know, we're still a ways away, unfortunately. I know. Um, so with that said, we're waiting on that very um, consciously. 
Um, but you know, all the things that people are are suggesting obviously are the kinds of things that we're going to put in place. Uh, you know, the tables will be six feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, the menus will be paper. Uh, the utensils and the goods will now be uh, recyclable paper instead of our, you know, what we've got. Um, you know, we'll be doing everything that everyone would s expect us to do. But as far as how we're going to serve and whatnot, um, and some of the conditions of our kitchen, where we do have a restaurant and the conditions of our um, of our snack bars, so we're going we're gonna to have to wait for the local compliance as well. Sure. Um, Kyle, what about you? What say you on the food and beverage uh, area? Do you, let me ask you this, do you offer uh, server um, based um, food and beverage serving uh, where they'll take your order and bring it to you? Or do you make, do they have to go up and get it themselves? And if so, how will that change? Yeah, so our location that's opening uh, Friday has full service food and beverage with a full bar, servers, um, full restaurant experience. Um, so like Karen said, um, our health department here in Oklahoma, the state health department and the local health department put out guidelines. Um, they're, you know, very common guidelines that everyone's seeing, the, the table rule. The six feet table, um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we, they, you were talking about party size. They're limiting party sizes to 10 or less. If you have a party okay. of 10 or more, it has to be in a private dining room. Um, okay. So that's interesting. That was, um, and they have not said when that will be larger, but um, the bar service is going to be interesting because we have this big long bar, but now maybe only four people can sit at it. Um, but, you know, as far as serving the food, we're going to do disposable menus in phase one. Also, um, you talked about the QR codes, or Craig did, I believe. We're going to have QR codes where you can actually just scan it and you can look at our menu on your phone. So that way you don't have to take nice. a menu. Nice. Uh, so we, we've done that. We've removed any condiments and um, it's going to be all brought out to you disposable. So instead of having the salt and pepper grinders, we're going to bring you the little packets, the little disposable packets. So. Um, obviously in the first phase one, we're going to have, um, all of our staff wear masks, especially in food and beverage. That'll probably even move on to multiple phases, but, um, everyone in phase one will wear masks and then, um, glove usage is going to be very monitored because I actually went in one of our employee training classes today. I told a story. It just, the glove usage is one of the things that extremely bothers me. I've seen people put on gloves, but then touch five or six mm -hmm. things. Before and they, count the money back to the person and then they leave the glove yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. That's a false well, security. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the glove deal is really bothersome to me, but I understand people want to see them. Um, I would just rather wash my hands every time. Um, and then, you know, one of the big things you guys talked about is also trying to encourage guests to not use cash. Um, legally, we can't not accept cash in our area, right. but right. Um, we can encourage people to use um, debit credit. So those are some of the things we're doing in the food and beverage area, but we're not, we've not really changed our menu. Um, we're going to go in with our same menu um, and just really see how things go. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there is no, like I said, there's no roadmap for this. So for most people, they're going to just try things and it's trial and error. I'm going to try it this way. I'm going to try it that way. If this doesn't work, I'm going to move on. I'm going to shorten my menu. I might be able to get away with doing the same menu. That's a valid point. Uh, the other uh, thing I want to ask about is, um, uh, two of you have laser, right? Or do more, Karen, do you have laser? Monty, you don't have laser, right? Yeah, I do. I do. You do. Okay. Karen, do you have laser? No. No, but Craig and Kyle both have laser, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, the question came up about uh, how um, social distancing will work in laser tag. And I've seen this before. And I think the answer that I saw one of the owner operators give was we're going to keep our laser tag closed until we it's safe to open it again. They're not even going to try to do social distancing with that because I mean, it's, I don't know how you would do it with the game the way that you can only shoot people. I mean, I don't know. Do you eat any, I'll start with you, uh, Monty. Do you have a plan to keep your laser tag open or have you made adjustments in that to account for social it'll be, distance? It'll be reservation only per group. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you know, am I going to open it for four people? If someone walks in, it's available. Yeah. I'll let them buy a game or two. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's going to be mostly reservations. And okay. Group. Yeah. Craig? Same. Uh, we're really pushing a lot of online or virtual queuing uh, for laser okay. tag. 
Um, but I, that one's going to be a challenge. I think we're going to do it yeah. just kind of group by group. You know, if my group wanted right. to go with a stranger's group and they're comfortable with that, then we would allow that. Otherwise, we wouldn't. It's kind of like uh, we have an indoor playground, a high velocity interactive play structure, and it's going to be the same thing. We're going to open it. If you're not comfortable going in there, then don't buy a wristband. Correct, correct. I love. I think that's probably going to be the mentality of most people. Even if you told them that um, every germ molecule in the world was m removed from the room and there was no way any could get in, there's still a certain segment of the population that says, I'm not doing it right now. So you, you might as well do it exactly the way you said, in my opinion. But, you know, you have to do what's right for your business. Kyle, I assume you're in the same boat. Yeah, pretty much. The only thing that I would add is that we are separating, we're, we're obviously cutting capacity in our laser tag arena. And then um, when the guests come out of the arena, the guns are put on one side of the room that's kind of designated the cleaning side of the room. Mm -hmm. And then um, those are cleaned while the next group is going. And so we're with cutting capacity. We obviously have guns now um, or phasers that can be used for both groups. So we're just doing a, a, a good job of that. And we had actually started doing that before we were shut down during those last kind of two weeks where everyone was starting to get weary of things. So we had started doing that and makes people feel comfortable when they see stuff being cleaned. Um, sure. but like Craig said earlier, I believe it was Craig that we're not gonna be able to police everyone. We're going to tell them, here's the rules, here's what you need to do, but I, we're not going to be able to walk around and just with our, you know, with a six foot stick and push it between everyone, you know, <laughs> Right. The, the public will do that for you. I'm sure. <laughs> I bet that's what will happen. All right. Here's another question from Ed McFadden. Um, he said, we're required to make an opening plan for the health department. Has anyone made a plan already? I'll start with you, Monty. No, we have not. Obviously, we're still waiting on what the um, the mandates are going to be in all three states. So, okay, yeah, I can make one, but then I'll have to redo it. I'm pretty sure. For and sure, for sure. And maybe Ed could tell us: Is there a template that the state of California is looking for? Ooh, that's a good question. Ed, type in the chat: Is there a template that the state of California has been looking for? with regard to that opening plan for the health department. I'll move on to Karen. Karen, have you thought about making an, uh, have you done anything with that opening plan yet? I, I assume not, because you're still in the not open stage at all. They're not close to being open, right? Well, correct. But I, I think the overarching message is that um, so much of what we're talking about today is the plan. Mm, and so, that's true. you know, it's just, I mean, I have an outline and, you know, when you asked me to speak, I went straight to that outline and, yeah. the, you know, I've, I'm, I'm watching what other organizations are doing. I'm watching what, what competitors in, you know, we're going to watch some of our competitors in other parts of the country open before we are, and I'm going to learn from them. So if someone asked me to put it together, tomorrow, I don't think it would be that difficult um, because it's going to be at an outline level, right? Um, the actual operational guidelines on how we're going to teach our employees internally, I don't think is what they'd be looking for. But I think at an outline level, any of us are now prepared to, to provide enough to, to facilitate that request. That's my so, assumption. <laughs> I, I, that's a good assumption, Karen. That's a good assumption. Uh, Ed typed back that there's no template that they're providing for you. So this is quite interesting because <laughs> it sounds to me like they'll just accept a paragraph. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe they won't accept it. Um, Craig, uh, what about what, what say you about this opening plan? Have you thought about that? Or are you waiting to kind of see what, what happens there too? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of been preparing some things here and there. Um, and like Karen said, I think we can whip something up. We already have a pretty good list of things that we will do, but we don't know the rules yet. So it's hard right. to do that for. That's the hardest part right there. What yeah. are you wanting me to tell you? Like, show me something. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say hello to Ed. He's a, he's a, one of our, one of our buddies here in NorCal. So I'm actually in Northern Nevada nor, and I'm NorCal as well in Northern California. Right. But anyway, I'm going to come um, see you when I bowl nationals in a, in, a, in about six months. <laughs> I hope so. You should, yeah, if, 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 it, if it actually gets off the ground, you should. Anyway, gonna, should it's, say, listen, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going <laughs> to happen. I just feel it. <laughs> Kyle, right. what, what about your company and the uh, plan? Do you have one ready or are you going to wait and just make it up as you need to? Yeah, we, we do have a plan. Um, we felt that we needed something that we could post um, and show that our guests what we're doing. We also uh, sent it to the mayor's office in the city 
that we're opening our location in Friday. And I literally just sent this and said, hey, Mayor, here's our plan. Um, we want you guys to feel comfortable knowing that we are doing whatever we can to take care of our guests and our employees and hoping that would, you know, get them relaxed. Because um, the more you can take care of your local political departments and political figures um, will make you, will do better for you. Trust me, from being on city council, I learned the hard way and I've learned that um, we you definitely need to take care of these people because they are not in our industry. And like our other facility that we have in another city, the local government is now dictating our industry and, and they don't know our industry. So right. um, whatever you can do to be proactive and get out there and let your local authorities understand that you have plan in place. Here's what you're going to do. Here's why it works. And that's very important in, in my opinion, because like in our other town that we can't open in until the end of the month, they allowed gyms to open, but they didn't allow bowling centers to open. That to me was just them not understanding our industry and that we're not, yeah. a, not we're not same. as bad as what they think. Yeah. Same here in Houston. They allowed theater, movie theaters to open, but they didn't allow bowling centers to open. And it was like, um, Okay, so you know, from a bowler point of view and somebody who's run facilities and, and for my entire life, I say, we have more room than a theater does. I, I don't know why you wouldn't allow the bowling center to open. Um, you know, the thing about the opening plans, which Rosa Katz brings up, she's check with other states because some states have required a plan, but Ohio, for example, uh, they needed to provide that plan prior to opening, but we don't know that every state's gonna need that plan beforehand. They might just hand you down some edict that says, here's what you must do to open and you, you've got to follow it. So uh, good questions out there for that. I'll go to one more thing. Um, Dustin Klein is asking about cleaning supplies. Have they found anything that works on the super touch screen and for bowling balls? Dustin, I'm gonna steer you to our um, COVID-19 page on Cubic AMF because we do have some guidelines there for cleaning uh, surfaces and what you can uh, look for to that. Yes, you can't just put any, any chemicals on electronics. We, we certainly understand that. Um, but we've, we've heard about all different kinds of things from bowling balls, you know, having a, a sanitation station for the customers themselves to clean the balls or sealing them in a bag after you've cleaned them to show that, you know, the customer's gonna open it and they know no one's touched it. There's a whole range of things you could do there. And I do believe that that's going to end up being, you know, preference of the operator and what they think is best for them. So um, do we have any more questions, Kyle, coming in from the chat room that I may have missed? What are you seeing out there, Kyle? Um, I believe that you have covered pretty much most of the questions that have come in. Yeah, well, we're at our time right now and I want to, I want, I still have to close. So I just, I don't want to leave anybody hanging in the chat. I want to be respectful of my guest's time. So I'm going to start the closing procedures now. So um, first thing, do you have any final words of advice or words of hope for our guests to take away from today's webinar? Who am I going to pick on first? I'm going to pick on Kyle. Yeah, I, I kind of gave mine at the very end. Just get out ahead of it and get your plan to your local government so you can be helping make your reopening plan, not letting someone else make it for you. I love that. I love that. It's, it's solid, sound advice. And use those connections that you have. Play whatever political game you need to to get in the right hands of people to say, I've got this. Here's what I'm doing. Let us go forward with it. Instead of you thinking, I know what to do. Right? So, Craig, how about you? Sorry about that. Um, more of the same. Uh, you know, we're going to utilize our social channels, our website, uh, signage within the facility. Uh, we're going to do some Facebook and Instagram live stuff. Uh, Kyle nailed it. And, you know, we're going to send our COVID-19, COVID report basically to the, to the Chamber of Commerce to let them know that, hey, we want to work with you. He's absolutely correct. And they don't understand our industry, um, you know, and how, how we're going to be operating and moving forward. And I think transparency is key. Uh, educating people within our industry and outside of our industry is going to help us all uh, succeed a lot faster. For sure, for sure. Karen, final words of advice or hope for our guests? What are yours? Well, um, you know, we're doing some fun things online right now. We're, we're, we just created a contest and we're doing more and more to engage our guests online um, through all of the traditional social media 
and email um, contact information that we have. Um, but I think it's important that that transparency, like everyone said, I would just ditto what everyone said. But one of the other ideas is thinking about how are you going to thank those in your community that have put their, their, their person forward um, or who have lost a great deal um, during this and encourage them, um, communicate to them that you want, you want to say thank you. So we're putting some promotions together for our fr frontline and emergency workers. Um, we're putting something together for all the kids who had birthdays in March and April and probably June. Probably May and June, right? Yeah. Um, so that, you know, our messaging of being part of the community is, you know, it's something we've always lived. We have a um, part of our, our, one of our core values is give back. And so we have a never say no policy on 501Cs anyway. So they know that about us but just doing more to be part of the recovery and moving forward. Okay. All right, Monty, you're gonna close this out today. I wanna to hear uh, final words to our guests who are listening to your information and the way you're attacking. What is your message of hope to them? Um, you know, just create that solid plan. You know, Karen mentioned earlier about flexible. You are gonna to have to pivot on your plan. The plan you come up with is not gonna be the plan you end with. So just be, uh, uh, transparent has been said earlier make sure everyone on your teams knows that that things are going to change and they're going to change quick and to, to be successful you just adapt um, and the, the last thing that I, I just like I'm going to be telling my teams let's not forget what we do and we we sell fun um, and let's let's keep it fun for everyone and, and safe and you know get our guests back in the door next week and the week after and the week after that well said, everyone. Well said. Um, I'm going to thank you right now. Thank you for attending today's webinar with us. I thank all of my guests, Kyle, Craig, Karen, and Monty, uh, our panel for joining us today. You are all leaders in the entertainment world, and we know our customers enjoy hearing from your experience. So we appreciate your participation in our efforts to hashtag support bowling. Um, Cubica AMF resources that are available to you. If you go to cubicaamf.com slash support, you, we have the, uh, the site that will walk you through the COVID uh, resources that are there from all over. We've got the BPAA, the, the IAPA stuff. We've got our own stuff. We've got small business association. So any kind of um, industry like OSHA, amusement recovery, et cetera, IAPA, like I said, they're all there under the COVID page at cubicaamf.com. We've also created the Beyond the Frame Facebook group where we do our live uh, videos Tuesday and Thursday, usually. Um, and if you want to join that, it's very simple. Just go to Facebook and type in Beyond the Frame. You'll see us there. Sign up. Just say, I want to be a member. And you're in and you can watch our videos. This new Facebook group that we created, the Beyond the Frame group, it's dedicated to supporting our local bowling center. We provide them a platform to share and support content. Uh, we provide outside the bowl marketing uh, tips and tricks. And we provide inside marketing tips and tricks too. Free resources that we give away, examples of success stories and how some bowling centers are able to really take advantage of the situation. Even though it's a bad time, they're making lemonade out of lemons and you can too. So we know that bowling centers are the fabric of the local communities and that's what makes bowling amazing. Um, we ask you to join our group and support bowling. So thank you very much for joining us today, everybody. And if you have any questions for today's webinar, please feel free to email. Here's a list. Uh, there we go. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just going to go to the, uh, the um, resources. There we go. Cubicams.com, the Facebook page, and be on the Facebook group. If you have any questions on today's webinar, feel free to drop us an email at info at cubicams.com. We'll be able to answer them there for you. And if you want to contact us about webinar, you can also reach out to Max Training Admin at cubicams.com. So we've answered all your questions from the chat uh, and I thank you for joining us. Reminder, join us next week. Our webinar on Wednesday, May 6th, will continue discussing the topic of reopening your center and provide best practices around the operational changes you may expect in your facility. 
On behalf of myself, Jay Nephew, Cubica AMF, Kyle Calcote, our webinar manager, and my panel, I wish you all an incredible week, weekend, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you all. Be safe, everyone.